by you. How kind of goosebumps are you going to get this weekend? I tell you what, every day I have my wife pinch me uh, to make sure everything is real. It's just been an incredible ride. What did uh, your dad tell you about playing here at Duquesne? Things he went through? Well, he loved playing at Duquesne. You know, the team was uh, extremely supportive. Uh, you know, back in 1946, when the University of Tennessee came to play Duquesne, uh, they weren't going to play if they allowed my dad to participate. And they took a unanimous team vote, and they sent Tennessee home without a game. And I really believe that's when the bar uh, with my dad at Duquesne University was, was initially forged. With you, with your dad, when did you understand what your dad meant on and, more importantly, off the court? That's a good question um, because, you know, he was a modest guy. He didn't talk about his NBA career that much. Uh, but I was somebody who always followed like son. I wanted to follow in his footsteps. So I was very interested. But, you know, in terms of knowing, actually in terms of knowing how good he was, it wasn't until 2000, 2001 when the NBA uh, paid tribute to him. And I got footage of him playing for the first time. And I'm watching the footage, and he's crossing over. He's finger rolling. He's shooting. He's right-handed. He's shooting, spinning left-hand hook shots. And I'm like, wow. I mean, I knew he could play one time when we were young. When I was young, I was probably about eight years old. And we were at the basketball court. And he picked up a ball. It was three quarters up, up the length of the court. And he said, Chuck, the longest. Now, he hadn't warmed up. He hadn't taken any shots. He said, this is the longest shot I ever made in the basketball game. He took a shot, nothing but nut. So he watched the half court and says, Chuck, this is the second longest shot I ever made in the basketball game. He takes the shot, nothing but net. So that was when I first knew there was something special about him on the basketball court. But really, it wasn't until 2000 or 2001 when I got a chance to see his NBA clips. And I really saw, you know, he had a little different flair to his game, but it was very controlled. He really played under control. When you saw the list of the presenters, yes. what went through your head when you heard about I'll be them? honest with you. When I saw the list of presenters, I was actually headed to a meeting. And I had to stop. I got pretty emotional. Yeah. Uh, those are guys who, you know, um, either were affiliated with his teams, um, uh, played, for, played for his teams, or, you know, he was very proud of or had a special affiliation with. So for all of those guys to say yes, because they don't have to, is very, very special. But I really think it speaks to the appreciation um, that they have for not only the contribution that he made to basketball, but also the sacrifice that he endured, you know, being being an early African-American pioneer in that time period. Will each one of those guys say a few words? I don't know if they'll say a few words during the ceremony, but there's a press conference and there will be report. Thank goodness there will be reporters everywhere. Uh, I'm sure they get a chance to say a few words. And um, we have a video crew that's going up to work on a Chuck Cooper documentary that we have uh, coming out. And we're going to make sure that we interview each and every one of them. But uh, it, it really, you know, I don't want to take it lightly. But those guys are all game changers. They're just not Hall of Famers. They're game changers. And we're incredibly honored that they agreed to present my father into the Naismith Memorial Basketball Hall of Fame. Who's doing the documentary? Uh, it's, 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 a, it's a combination project with, uh, with a couple people who I don't want to get ahead of it right now. Mm -hmm. So we're not re quite ready to announce that okay. yet. But as soon as we are, we'll make sure that we get the word out to you guys. But it's a, it's a very exciting group that we have together and uh, very talented. And uh, we think it's going to be a dynamite project. Are you going to have to say a few words? I think I will. Oh, yeah. But not, not I, I'll be at a press conference event. Mm -hmm. um, my video of the, uh, my, my, uh, my dad's enshrinement acceptance speech was videotaped. Uh, so the pressure's off as far as that's concerned. But there'll be a lot of media opportunities where I get a chance to, to speak on behalf of my father. Okay. What did your dad teach you about basketball, about playing the game and respecting the game? Well, you know, I always wish he would have taught me more. You know, one of the things that, that, that I was, you know, and this is on a very personal level and a very selfish level that I always really thought hurt me. My dad was older when he had me. But one of his protégés, he had two protégés in Pittsburgh who made it to the NBA. Uh, Maurice Stokes, who, who was uh, on track to be one of the greatest NBA players in the history of the game, and also Ed Fleming. And uh, he always told me that Maurice wouldn't have got sick. You know, he ended up uh, falling and having a brain injury and ended up with encephalitis. Uh, that he would have been like my big brother mentor. So, you know, that's like LeBron James or Kareem or Bill Russell being your mentor and, and teaching you the game. So, uh, you know, he, he was very encouraging. 
um, and he gave me a lot of a lot of finer points uh, about the game. But he was a little older, so he couldn't really get out there and play with me as much as he wanted to. And and then he, he also had to fear where he didn't want to push me. You know, my father was always a little bit more. Uh, or letting us know a little bit more that education is, is really the way to go because that's something that can never be taken away from you. What do you want as far as your dad's legacy in the city of Pittsburgh and to the people of Pittsburgh? Uh, how do you want that to grow and how do you feel like it's going to grow with the new arena and now with this? I really just want people to know that he was somebody that was, um, he, he cared about the city of Pittsburgh and he really was passionate and cared about the people of the city of Pittsburgh. And to see the city, uh, Duquesne University, um, you know, to, to continue to show him love and recognize his contribution, not just to basketball, but being the first African-American city department director, being the first urban affairs officer of any race for uh, uh, PNC's predecessor, Pittsburgh National Bank, uh, really speaks volumes to, to how he was as a leader and his character as a man. When you get into Massachusetts, there will be people that obviously are very, very well understanding of Chuck's story, but there's some that maybe need that education. Just how do you try to strike that balance? Well, um, you know, first of all, you kind of want to see where they're coming from, what, what part of their legacy they're interested in. But, you know, whenever we get an opportunity to talk about my father's story, and, and, and really the thing that really um, we're probably even more proud of than him being uh, the first African-American drafted in the NBA is him getting a master's degree for the University of Minnesota in 1960. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, he's somebody who lived by example and just believed in the importance of education, the importance of education and the importance of community service. Uh, so really, if, if, if they get that, uh, that, 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 that would be incredible. When did you first find out that he was the first black captain in the NBA? Because you said he didn't t say too much about his career. Yeah. How did you first find that's out? That's a good question, how I first found out. I don't even know if I know the answer to that. You know, certainly, certainly it came up at some point, but again, it wasn't something that he really talked about that much. But if you ask him a question about it, you know, he would take time and, and, and talk to people. And, 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 and I remember going to the store with him. You know, we would go to get a loaf of bread. I was his only son, and uh, I always wanted to be with my dad. And then, you know, he's going to the store. I said, "Yeah, then I'd like to go with you." But a trip to get a loaf of bread would take hours because people would come up to him and want to talk to him. He was a type of person who just took time for people. He really, he truly loved people. Where were you living at that time? Up in East Hills. Uh, East actually, it was called Walkersburg Manor. Uh -huh. So farthest point, you can go east in the city of Pittsburgh. How old were you when he passed? I was 19, going on 20. Uh, okay, she, so you, he saw you play basketball then? He saw me play at Shelley High School, and he also saw me play at, um, I, I went, left Shelley and went to Salem College on a, on a scholarship, came back to CCAC, so he saw me play at all three of those schools. You know, I, I think he thought I had a pretty good game. Uh, he always told me that I didn't take it as serious as he did. He always thought that he was on a mission, and, uh, and I was chasing his footsteps, but I don't think I was quite as dedicated to the craft as he was. <laughs> pretty hard to do that. <laughs> yeah, absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. With the way the game is today, what would your father say about how things are both on the court and off the court with players being more vocal about subjects? I think, I think he would be, um, I think he would embrace that. Um, I think he would be incredibly excited that the NBA probably is the most diverse global league in the world. So, you know, to open that door and be affiliated with a league that is, uh, is probably more embracing of, of, uh, of minorities and diverse populations, I think he'd be incredibly proud. Thank you very much.